Yeah. Welcome everyone to TNG Online Connect. So if you haven't uh, attended TNG Online Connect before, uh, obviously the whole purpose of this is to widen your TNG group to larger than your region, to across New Zealand with groups all over, and obviously bring some education in uh, with guest speakers from our very own TNG members and guest speakers as well, uh, covering a wide range of topics. So talking about guest uh, speakers, uh, so today we've got Matthew Prasad who is um, going to be talking about taking small steps and not believing everything you see. So Matthew is the director and um, and urban, he's an urban design specialist at Holistic Open Environments. So as you're probably well aware, the property market is doing some weird and strange things at the moment. Uh, so obviously post-COVID, um, the housing market caught up an average of 14% uh, to a lot of people's surprise. Uh, however, in recent months, this has obviously changed. Um, there's been a bit of a dip or a bit of a, um, a, a bit of a pause in the housing market, that sort of thing. But you know, if you're looking into property, where do you start? Um, do you talk to friends? Do you talk to family? Um, mortgage broker? Where do you get your advice from? So this is where Matthew comes in, and uh, really interested to see uh, what you've got to, to tell us, Matt. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Um, yes, um, kia ora everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so today's presentation, I guess, um, uh, is going to be a little bit of a hybrid, I guess, um, about this property market and and the advice that we give to our clients, but also how we've kind of all had that advice applied to our business as well. So a little bit of a talk about what we do, how we do it what we um, talk to our clients about and how we take them through the process and what people should be looking out for and how we've taken that advice back into our business as well and, and how that's morphed it um, over time. So um, I'll get right into it. Um, I have split it up into two general sections, um, the small steps and the don't believe all that you see. So let's hope it all makes sense in the end. <laughs> So, uh, let me give me one second here. So, holistic urban environments, Hugh, for short. Um, it is me, but it's not just me. Uh, it is a group of people, and we have grown quite rapidly over the last three years. So, so much so that we haven't had time to take photos, and we've got cutouts of people in there. And how that growth has happened is a lot of the actions and advice that we have uh, imparted to our clients and how we've then incorporated that into our business model. So I'm going to go through a little bit about what we do and uh, to make a bit more sense of um, the advice um, that we put out into the, into the market and how that's um, translated into our business. So what we do, we are placemakers and urban development specialists. So um, that's a, a little bit perplexing to people. So Urban development is pretty easy. Um, you know, take a property, change it into more homes, um, and it you know, people see that around their neighbourhoods happening all the time. So it makes sense to them. Um, the placemaking bit is the challenging uh, thing. It's about people. So we come from uh, a people-centric um, approach, and so this extends beyond property and and spreads out into the urban realm. This is a simple, you know. Uh, repurposing of some public of some car parking space into a bit more people friendly public space um, there's cafes um, around if you've ever been to Thames um, you can see that they've got cafes and restaurants that have um, extended their dining area and thereby increased their revenue um, by making these small changes um, and getting more seating because you know table covers is money so we help people um, and we help um, environments to be more uh, people-centric. How we do that? Um, we do that in three three distinct ways. Um, we investigate, we assist, and design. Now, the best way to illustrate that is investigate. Um, like I said, it's quite um, straightforward. We help people understand what they potentially can do with the property. So in the case of uh, this client, he owned a similar property to this one. He was um, selling, putting it onto the market. And he uh, wanted to just uh, 
add some extra value to that sale process and get people interested. Um, developers, for example. Uh, so he just wanted to do a really quick um, uh, uh, demonstration of what was possible. We did this, added extra um, dollars to the sale price, developer bought it, he's building the homes. And so that's one of the ways that we help people achieve that. Um, we don't only do it for the private market, we do it for social housing and all sorts of corporations um, as well. So not just individuals. Um, uh, this was a, a tri-party um, example. We help them investigate the best way to achieve some of their um, charter um, requirements as a community housing provider. So that which was completely different to a private um, market scenario. So that was investigate. Um, assist is a, is a little bit different. Um, it's, it's, it's really bespoke. The best way I can kind of describe it is um, it's like the tactician on, on, on the America's Cup. You've got your captain who's a client, you have all your consultants who are the various um, members on the boat. We're just another member on the boat in that regard. And we provide a strategy to get um, to a winning position. Uh, and that can, that can be very different for, for different clients. So we don't, it's, it's a very bespoke service. Um, often it's for other professionals. Uh, we work with architects and engineers um, and they struggle to perhaps um, come up with a solution that marries all the conflicting issues that they have. And so we become this go-between person that manages all these issues and then try and then comes up with a solution that makes everybody happy and then gets it across the line. So exactly like a tactician, he takes all the information that's coming in, advises on the decision to the client, the captain, and he makes the decision to turn the boat and get to the end. That's how, and that's how we hopefully translates as how we assist people. Um, and then we design everything. Um, so we go through this process of kind of investigating things and helping people, but ultimately we are designers. We actually do the process. We actually take it from start to finish, but that's across a myriad of things. Um, property is one of them. Um, you know, like I said, we're creating people places. Um, this was um, a space activation thing that we did, which was trying to create, create a whole bunch of um, community spaces um, out in the, um, out in East Auckland, uh, and it was about creating um, and connecting and giving purpose to an environment that was really neglected. Um, again, we know we do property development, um, but off across all scales and types, um, and you know high rise stuff, and we're across the entire um, sector here. And so, people think um, development as in um, buildings, but we also doing water parks. Um, uh, so that was a really interesting thing that's come out of COVID. Um, there was um, internal tourism um, was a really big thing. We don't have that many internal attractions for New Zealanders. A lot of it has been pitched to um, external tourists, you know, and therefore um, we don't have very many places where, who, where do Aucklanders go that isn't, um, something already geared towards the external tourist market, whereas something is a day trip. Where, um, so what, what is that environment? So Wairira not being around, there was an opening in the market. Um, and so we're working and helping um, deliver some, uh, a new water park, hopefully, um, if that happens. And, and so there's a lot of these types of things that are happening, say for school streets, you know, how do your kids get to school? everybody remembers walking and biking to school not um when they were younger most kids don't walk to school these days um, they get dropped off in the car um that has issues social health all those kind of things um most importantly kids want to walk to school because they get to catch up with their friends sooner um, and have a chat and natter and play before they even get into school and and so it's more play time for them so we're looking at uh, how do we how do we help uh, kids uh, just be more independent and get to school safe? And holidays, chalets, and, and all sorts. Again, going back to that internal tourism. Um, so COVID had this massive disruption, but it's also created all these other opportunities that we didn't even expect. So we're involved in helping people understand and get the outcomes that they desire. So it's not necessarily just property development. 
Um, but that is what people um, uh, associate quite easily because it's near to them. It's maybe a couple of houses down the street that they've seen at Development Hammond, and so that's what they associate with. But the spectrum is quite large, and that's our point of difference. Um, we don't focus, we would focus on more on strategy and um, getting an outcome for our clients rather than the product as per se. So that's a real quick kind of cap of what we do. Um, hopefully, by me quickly going through that, going through the next bit, these small steps um, for starters will make a little bit more sense of how it's kind of how it works for our clients and how it's worked for us as a business. So, typically, people think, you know, let's just say they're building one house. For example, they're just putting a house in the back of the section. They've got an idea. Oh, they think they'll get some, they'll get a design done, they'll slap it into council, get permission, and they get away and build. That's roughly true. Um, however, the um, it's 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 very um, base understanding, and what people get caught up with, and a lot of people in the industry, including professionals, is that there's a lot going on in those stages themselves. Now, coming back to this um, America's Cup analogy again, I'm, I'm going to do this three times something. <laughs> so, people think that they just show up to the start line go around the buoys and cross the finish line. That's the race. When actually there's a lot that goes on before that um, and within the race itself. So there's the pre-start in the America's Cup race. A lot of the race is won and lost even before you, they've crossed the starting line. So getting into that position that puts them into a winning position before they've even started the process is really important to them. And if you take that analogy even further back, what do they do back on the harbor or you know, in their boat shed? They choose the right sails, they analyze the weather and stuff, their boat design. They, they look into and get prepared before they even start the race. And then throughout the race, they're constantly um, analyzing and changing and making decisions. And around each each, um, each buoy that they go around each corner, um, they, they have to perhaps change their tactics. So there's little actions all along the way. And most importantly, well before they even start doing the race, even, even before they start the race. So what we do is we really advise our clients to, before they start anything, break down the process into as many steps as possible. We help them understand what those steps are. Um, so those four kind of general um, steps can be kind of broken down into these growth, these smaller um, sections. So even at the idea stage, you know, can you break that down into a few more steps? You know, just go through a real simple investigate what is possible. Have you done some testing on it in terms of? Is it going to sell? Are you going to get finance for it? And then through the design phase, there's actually, you don't just start the design and throw something out the end. There's actual steps within that. Getting permission from council. It's not a one step process. There's definitive three steps and those are quite um, elaborate. Getting resource consent. After you've got resource consent, you have to get engineering plan approval and building consent. All of these add time and is involved quite and it's quite involved and then getting to build you don't just simply pick up a hammer and start building do you tender the project you know do you who, who's going to build it you've got a maybe got three or three builders that you want to get prices from that's actively tendering and there's a process around that but then there's a construction getting to the point where you can actually move in there's a whole bunch of steps and processes so what we do is we, we break this down and, we, and clients, we encourage them to break the process down even more than this if they can, including uh, going through just the permission or design phase. Have, have a, having smaller steps enables them to pause the process and escape out of the process if it becomes too, too much for them. Because it is building a place, even just one, is a lot of effort. It's a lot of risk. Now, when you start to talk about developments, that's the risk explodes quite greatly. And so having a strategy around 
what you're going to do when something starts to go sideways is really important. But often people don't know what that, what that action will be. But breaking it down into small steps enables them to, to, at each of those small steps, make a decision if they go forward to the next one. And so the more steps you have, it may seem a little bit laborious, but it ensures that their risk and their sanity is kind of managed. So we looked at this and we obviously then articulated that in our, in our whole business model. So we, that's why we have, have this whole entire investigate phase. Now, and then we broke it down into small chunks of fees. So this is us taking our own advice that we give to our clients and making it into making it part of our business model. And it's been part of why we have been um, successful, I guess, because when, you, when a client comes to us and they go, yeah, I want to do a project. I've got a house, I want to knock it down, put three, four, five, however many on it. Great, that's you know, 50, 60, 70, $80,000 what it, to do the entire process. Oh my God, I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to walk away and just forget about this. That's a project loss to us. And so what, we, what we've done is that by placing or showing our clients a whole bunch of small steps, and we've just got two steps here, a high level, feasibility, high level capacity study and a development feasibility, they're small fees, low risk, they can understand it, they can investigate it, get some assurity about it, go to the bank, get, understand that they're gonna get the money, um, go to the accountant, all those kind of things, get there, but they have something to have those conversations with and, and have that with, and meaningful conversations. And often um, having a step that, most people go with the development feasibility phase, um, and they do that because when they look at a high level one and they go, oh yeah, that's 750, oh, for $1,500, I get so much more, or even four and a half thousand. Having a price point just, um, which works for us, but is uh, less, uh, helps our clients go to the next one up. So by having um, just that high level one, we, we do very little high level capacity studies. It's, it's almost um, very low volume uh, simply because um, we have the development feasibility study there as a, as a decent step that's low risk, but, um, but it works for us even more financially. There's more, stride, there's more uh, finer grain steps that we can go into depending on, cut, on the client and the cost and, um, and what they're after. Uh, but what we've understood is that presenting our clients with a um, series of small steps that they can take and pricing it helps them make a decision to then ultimately getting to the big chunk of fees, which is what we really want to do and what we want, what we want them, what we want to do personally, because that's the big design exercise and the big project that goes and has a bit of um, life to it. Our clients feel comfortable with our services at that small fee. They'll, they'll recommend us to others. Just go get this feasibility done. So, you know, it's not going to cost you much. And so we do a lot of volume work in that visibility without too much marketing or, or effort purely because we do it and we charge for it. A lot of people don't charge for this service. They give it out for free, um, which is a bit of a concern to me. And I'll come to that in the second part of, my, uh, of this presentation. What, what we've found is that if we're upfront and say, well, it's not a free quote, it's not anything, we're going to stand behind it. It's a small fee, and you have some sureties of it. Um, gives our clients a lot more confidence about it. So that's how we've kind of done our service. But that's the um, that's the that's the work. And from that, we actually added more steps to our business internal, which would um, which we make which we articulate externally. So within our whole kind of delivery of services. We have these value sets called human practical elegant. We ask our clients all the time, what is your goal? So we don't ask them what, what type of work you want done. We, we ask them what 
what's their goal. Um, if they're building to own, if they're building to rent, if they're building to sell, all have different outcomes and they have a different strategies attached to that. So when we took that advice ourselves, we said, well, what are we doing? What, why are we doing what we're doing? We've got this work, we like doing it, but what are we gonna infuse in everything? Why are our clients gonna come back to us? Um, we came up with these three value sets, human, practical, elegant. Human is like I mentioned before, human-centric design, but also um, where we actually communicate in a, on human terms. So this whole property sector, resource consents, council, whole, that, that entire field is just full of jargon. And I'm still guilty of it. I talk, I, I honestly talk in acronyms too much. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. <laughs> so that human aspect is not only creating human environments, but a human communication and human interactions. If we can explain, so our drawings, are very explicitly uh, geared towards um, legibility, making it graphically easy to read. I don't know how many have, how many people have seen architectural drawings. Um, it can get quite heavy, and if you don't know what what you're looking at, you can miss a lot of information. And most people aren't really great at reading plans to start off with. And within the industry, that's true there's actually people that that mistake what things are on a plan they're just not um they're not they're not trained and they're not architects so that's we assume nobody's an architect and that's how and that's our baseline and we start from that position practical um i'll, I'll touch on this a little bit in the second part is it's just things we have to get to a uh, an outcome uh, and and so people need to uh, achieve something and that's where we have our small steps and our, and our fees we understood people couldn't make that big leap to the big chunky fee they, they needed more practical steps to get to there and breaking that down to, into smaller steps was really the practical approach to engaging with our clients we gave them a way or a method of getting to the to the goal that they wanted to and that was simply just by breaking down to small steps um and then we have finally have elegant um this, this is a selfish thing. We, we want to create great places. It's a little bit different from beautiful because that can be um, highly subjective. So elegance is for us, it's longevity. It's, it's something that is classically there all the time and it has permanence. So we infuse these elements into our, into our work and it's a step before we even engage with the client and all the way through the project as we deliver it no matter how small or big it is. So we, while we may not articulate this to our client that we're doing these steps, they're an internal process to manage our quality. And by doing that, we deliver a product at the end that's always meeting um, our company, uh, our company brand, essentially, you know, why would people want to engage with us? They can go to somebody else, they can do the same thing. But oh no, they'll come to you because they deliver this and they do it, deliver in this way. And we only can achieve that by having infusing the smaller steps of, of kind of revisiting and constantly checking that are we achieving these three value sets in our, in our project for our clients? So this is us taking our advice that we give to our clients. And, to, and seeing how it could be applied internally into our business model. And it's paid dividends. Um, it's, it's, worked, it's been working really well. And it's, it's a constant improvement process. Um, it's, an, it's not a static thing. It's, it's never a static. So that's kind of taking small steps um, and how, how we've taken that advice to our clients and brought it internally and, it's, and how it's become a bit of a circular um, uh, situation. Then we come to um, don't believe all that you see. There's um, I'm going to talk about this in, in two parts, both what's happening out in the world and us as a business. So we see a lot of this. Excuse me, I'll just have a thing of water. Now. 
I won't say where I got this from. It was from a real estate listing um, from a very large um, real estate firm. Um, and they simply had this. Now, great. So they show, they show us a site that can take a whole bunch of homes on it um, and it creates some excitement and hopefully the, the client thinks that they can get some extra value out of it. However, there's certain things that you need to look out for when you, when you do see this. Um, where's the company name for starters? Um, who, who's created it? Um, what, if any, um, tags there are? So on this one, you won't find a company logo or anything like that. So already I'm skeptical about what's going to be possible. So we looked at it. What? of what they've actually proposed. Now the top drawing is what they have shown. That pink line is the driveway, is, the, is a compliant driveway gradient. The bottom drawing shows what happens when you place those buildings with a compliant driveway. And all that uh, beige between the pink and the dark and the black line is fill is earth that you will have to bring onto site to make it work. So yeah, you can get those buildings onto the site, but how much is it gonna to cost to put that dirt there? How much the retaining wall sizes, that just, just, just the dollar value of the dirt is gonna be ridiculous. Um, and, the, and then you've got the retaining walls. Then there's the ability to get consent for that. Um, so in essence, you can't achieve what they've drawn. So that's what they've shown, but in reality, it's not achievable. So they, they, they're creating a false sense of expectation. Yeah. And it, it, this was quite prevalent, um, and it is kind of still prevalent at the moment. Um, with the heated market, almost everybody believed everything was developable. And so you can put anything anywhere and just get this maximum outcome ha happening. And so we saw a lot of these plans and a lot of clients coming to us going, oh, we've, we're, we're looking at buying this place and it's, they're showing this and we look at it and kind of go, um, yeah, you can't achieve it. Some of them would have not made an offer, but some of them had, and you can very quickly see them um, trying to backtrack out of deals, which brings us back to what I talked about earlier, taking small steps. If they had just taken a small step and investigated themselves before going to the point of making an offer, they would have uh, de-risked themselves. But equally, they shouldn't have believed anything that they saw, including when they do some, when we do something, we ask them to question it. You know, really, really interrogate it. And one of the reasons wh why um, we see problems is, is something like this, um, where it, it looks feasible and um, a lot of people are guilty of, of saying this is, and we have clients come to us, they, they say, oh, look, it's got services on the street. So if you can see that red and um, uh, if you can see my mouse. Pointer. Um, so these, it says it has, you know, pipes in the, in the street, right. But the site is sloping away from the street. So, so this greenhouse, great. It's above the pipe, so you can get it. Water flows downhill. It doesn't go uphill. Um, so these pipes can flow down to the street pipe. This one's a bit marginal. You might be able to get it to work if, if you really tried your engineering. You know, the engineer's going to have to work for his money to make that work. But the red one's not possible. It's, be it's, it's below the street. So how do you get your sewer and your stormwater to go uphill? It's very, very difficult. It's, it's not possible. It's very expensive. It's not going to be achievable. Really hard to get consent for it. So we see a lot of these false promises. So even if people don't show a plan and they show um, a council map and they say, oh, look, it's got a stormwater line and a sewer line in the street, you can connect to it. This is a development site. You can go ahead. Um, you can't. So if you've ever driven down a street, and you go, oh, why is that side of the street got 
new houses, but that side hasn't. There will be other reasons. It, uh, most likely something like this. So ultimately, you want some a scenario like this where every house is above the um, above the uh, street connection, and so everything flows down. So now it's a development site. Now it totally changes if if you have a pipe in the back of the property. So the same scenario happens. But this is the kind of edge, um, trap that people kind of fall into, and it's it's all about. And this is why we say to everybody: just don't believe anything. Um, you, you really have to go with a, a heavy dose of um, skepticism about anything. Obviously, people selling a property, um, the owner, the vendor, um, want to get the maximum price in there, and that's the right thing to do. Um, but it's generally led from not any type of malice, but just misunderstanding of what is possible or how it's possible. Um, so, and there's websites out there that, um, that do development assessments. You know, you can go through plugging number and say, oh, look, you can subdivide this property and so forth, and you'll get X amount of profit. It's very dangerous doing that because if you don't actually look at it, one or two finer things in detail, um, you can get unstuck. And we have unfortunately had, had to advise clients, you know, you've bought a lemon, get out of the deal. Um, and, and, they've come back to us on other projects because we've had, because we've given that honest advice to them. And that doesn't, ex this extends to all sorts of other things as well. That's the technical engineering, but there's planning rules as well. And, um, and one of the big things is people just generally misunderstand how planning rules work. So on the, um, on the left here is what the planning rules say you can build. You know, you can build 50% of the site or whatever, um, and you can stick a great big block of building on there. But even when you do that, when you maximize the site coverage, um, other rules start to um, come in. And even then, all this red bit is not possible. And then when you start going, well, actually, we've got to sell these things and we've got to get car parking, we've got to get yards, we've got to get these other rules to work. Oh, no, um, we're going to arrange some buildings in this way. Um, you still find it very difficult to comply with the rules. The red bits are still not possible. So there are, people read the top line of things. There's pages and pages of other stuff. That's where we come in, we're professionals and we help people through that process. So that's a bit of that assist kind of um, thing coming in. Where this has become problematic is in recent, recently with um, new rules um, that have been proposed. So we have headlines, you know, um, so being, you know, three stories without consent and, oh no, we're gonna lose sunlight and there's gonna be all these horrible three-story buildings everywhere. The reality is um, you can't achieve hell of a lot. These are three-story buildings with more or less the controls that are proposed or that are within those um, laws. So. The, the top left here, you know, three stories, bulk and rules. Oh, look, you can't actually build three story on the boundary. Oh, look, okay, let's, let's apply some of the rules. Um, you still can't achieve it. You know, all this red bit has to get knocked off. So really only two stories possible. Oh, and we have to get some car parking and some other things and make it market attractive so we can actually sell these things. Again, getting really, really difficult, you know, for this to get consent, there is no way that it will. You have to get resource consent for it um, to get that permission to infringe like that. And I can tell you now, it won't get consent. It's too great. And so as part of all this kind of stuff in the, in the world at the moment, which is just creating this false expectation of kind of fear or I don't want to say disinformation. It's more kind of like headline information, really. Um, people taking almost um, just the top top line and, and not reading the, the paragraph underneath. So this this became the next thing that, that Hugh has been doing. And so now we're in the process of dissemin disseminating information. What it is, what this information is, what is being proposed, what does it actually mean? What, what, what's happening in the world? 
So I mentioned, you know, we 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 do an assist service, and so now we we're proactively providing that assistance up front and creating an even more finer, smaller grain step for a client even beforehand, getting information out there. Some information we um, were gatewaying because it's quite valuable and we'll, we charge for it. Some information like this one, it's we make it freely available. Um, it's And our clients are responding really well to it. Um, and putting out information that just says, well, you, there, we have no information, you know, council and or whatever has not come out with any advice is just as good to our clients as saying that they have done something, because most most often clients don't know, uh, don't know anything, and just knowing that that something doesn't exist is just as good as knowing that something does exist. It's it's just as valuable to them, and so we're now actively uh, and proactively uh, creating content that um, we're putting out into the world and and it's getting picked up. I've done media appearances and, and things like that on Radio New Zealand and so forth uh, based on some of this information information that we're putting out into the world because nobody else is. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. It, and not that any of this is difficult. We just read the stuff. <laughs> and then applying our value set, human practical elegant, we made the language easy to understand we compartmentalized it into chunks of information that people could digest, you know, understanding they need to un, un, um, practically understand what's going on. And then, you know, being elegant about it, presenting it in a way that is engaging and, and attractive to, to them. So they want to be part of it. Um, we could have made this, we could have had no diagrams, we could have just done a bullet point uh, screeds of information it would have done the job but would people have engaged with it probably not um so so us applying our value set to how we wanted to approach this has been really invaluable to that uh, to, to this outcome so lastly how we how, how has this kind of all happened to us we, we say we're placemakers and urban development specialists. Um, and I've touched on um, what they are. We didn't, we didn't start off with this. And we actually, you know, this is our conventional name. We're urban designers and architectural designers. Really easy for people to kind of understand that. Urban designers, they're still a bit fuzzy about, but you know, actually, but that pigeonholed us. Um, to um, a very specific product or service that we um, that people had already in their mindset. When you say the term, you know, architect or architectural designer, um, people think you know you do X. Y is not possible. Z, A, B, all the other letters are not possible. By actually going to and saying that we're placing urban development created more confusion for our clients. Um, but in the way that they actually engaged in conversation with us. And that was actually a really interesting turn of events. Um, it may not work for every industry. I and mean, if, you, if you sell you know, green t-shirts, we want, we want to say we green t-shirt seller, you know, but for us in our particular industry and what the work that we do, it was actually really helpful to create this, uh, a little bit of ambiguity um, to, to what we are, to start spark conversations. And it was precisely because um, people saw that we only did one, one, if we put out our name, they only saw that. They didn't believe we did anything else. You know, how could you do that? You've got, you're an architectural designer. How could you do that? Well, we do. Um, and so we, by changing our titles and uh, what we call ourselves, we, we opened up a field of work for, to ourselves that, um, or engagement to do that type of work that wasn't previously available. And, and that's helping for our um, um, diversifying our client base and our project base. So by taking the word architectural designers out of our title, we work for architects. They don't feel as threatened. You know, why would I engage another architect to help me? I'm, I'm going to feel inferior that that's going to happen. But actually, oh, we're placemaking an urban development special. Oh, okay, cool. 
that it's, they're not the same as me. So we have a lot of projects where we actually help other architects do better um, and to uh, solve the um, really tricky situations um, that they may have. And that's where our, speci our speciality comes in. Um, and that's that assist service. So then by changing our name, saying we, we have provided an assist service, um, dramatically changed our um, business um, in, in ways that I had not had anticipated when I started out. And this has evolved um, over the last three years by taking incremental small steps and in changing and looking and revisiting parts of my business um, in a feedback loop from how we provide us uh, service to our clients. So yeah, I hope that's me. And I hope that was somewhat interesting and informative, uh, but intertwined and all over the place, but yeah. Awesome, uh, thanks so much, um, Matt. That was uh, really educational. I know uh, Malcolm had a few questions uh, that he had. So uh, what geographical areas do you work in? Um, so we work across all of New Zealand. Um, there is no, um, we have projects, projects concentrated in Auckland, um, but we have projects in Hastings, um, we have projects in Hamilton, Tauranga, we're picking up projects in Wellington. Uh, we, it, where it is um, beyond the North Island, we normally partner, um, but we're not geographically low, um, constrained in any way. Um, in any sense, um, New Zealand's quite small <laughs> in, in, in that, but sometimes uh, we could be helping um, engineers down in uh, Christchurch, for example, mm -hmm. um, and that's our assist service. And we may, we're not involved in any design aspect at all and COVID and everything, people are more comfortable with remote um, business, so. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then what qualifications do your team have? So we are consisted of uh, architects, urban designers, planners, and we have kind of consultants um, in um, economic strategy and stuff like that. But um, within the team, within the eight people that are in the team, there is um, three architects and, and two urban designers and one is a planner, urban designer. Do we uh, do any of um, any more questions? Theo. Yeah, sorry. Uh, firstly, apologies, uh, Matthew, for, for tapping in a bit late. But um, I, I just caught part of your presentation that really, really struck a chord with me because it's something that I've been thinking about in the last wee while too, and I applaud you for that. And that is the fact that... Um, you know, you talked about what people know, what clients know, and what mm. they don't know. The big danger for any business or a prospective client is not knowing what they don't know, mm. because they are then absolutely, uh, you know, um, ready to be ripped off by someone who is unscrupulous. So the steps that you're taking to lay things out in very simple fashion, articulating, educating people that is really a cool cool step really a cool step because it really sets you apart from everybody else so i really applaud you on that um well done and the other thing that i really really uh am, am very keen on as well is this whole thing like you said uh just taking these incremental steps building on steps reevaluating, and taking the next step and by taking quick steps incrementally you can go a lot faster than going for the big bang that many businesses want to go and then they fall flat on their ass. So well done. Oh, thank you. Excellent yeah, I mean, work. Ex um, this recent discover discovery, I should say, um, of providing information to our clients and is, is, I, I didn't think much would come out of it, but it's been received really well. Um, and like I said, it, just telling them that this information doesn't exist or, or there's nothing in this field or there's no communication from government council whatever is really valuable to them just just knowing that, that you know 
there's nothing. <laughs> it, the expectation that we need to tell them, oh, there's something, there's, there's, you know, there's some quality of information. Um, they were just uh, pleased that they knew nothing existed, um, which was really, really great. And we've, and it's, it's great. It's re, it's um, building relationships. Um, and it's continuing uh, the relationships as well. So that's been really great. And it's, and the incre and it comes down to those incremental steps, like you said, um, w people get scared off when they see quite a large fee. Um, and, 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 th and then they go shopping. This is a large fee, I'm gonna go ask somebody else if that's right. And by having these small steps, um, they build up trust by paying, by, engaging with those small steps and paying small um small fees and so when you do drop a big fee it's like well okay cool that must be the fee <laughs> and and so there's no there's no kind of argument or, or skepticism that that that's actually what it costs which has been really great because otherwise we, we lost a lot of business at the start by just dropping the big fee and 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 i, I we wondered what that was but ever since we moved to that model, um, it, it's we've had more success than not. Um, hey, look, um, I was one of the pop those couple of questions, Matthew. Thank you for doing that. Great presentation. Um, look, I would just share with the guys um, the totally support um, Matthew. And just a quick note, if you like, around fee. I um, worked as a business coach advisor with, in fact, I worked with three architects, learned um, a heck of a lot about, you know, that profession. But just in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a direct point, if you like, around the money side of things, because, you know, in any charter professional like you guys are, they have this association that, you know, you all charge 500 bucks an hour and, <laughs> and all you end up with is pretty pictures. But I had a look at five of my clients' projects and they ranged in price from probably $100,000, no, probably $50,000 right through to $3 million. And in each of those cases, we found and then started to pitch the work for the client on the basis that the fee, it might've been 20 grand, it might've been 30 or 50 grand, whatever, it was quite a big number, that we could conclusively prove that that money would be saved. Um, and that that was, um, you know, we, we could clearly prove that um, by taking the original concept, having the, doing the sort of work that you've described to us, Matthew, that we could see huge savings, um, you know, just, um, and, and we worked obviously quite closely with a uh, with a you know with a QC with with an estimator a really good estimator around that process. Then we come back to the clients and pitched pitched the price that way. Mm. On top of that, of course, you guys take away all the worry, you know. Mm. And we actively effectively end up. I didn't understand how architects project manager work and things like that. But I think there's a huge problem in New Zealand with the average Joe by not understanding what an architect actually does. You know, and I, yeah. I would just make that that comment to you, Matthew, as you look at marketing your organisation. That um, I had no idea. And I'm a reasonably clued up person, done a owned a number of homes and been involved with commercial clients. Had no idea what you guys do. So I would just, you know, reinforce to the group that um, there is huge value in engaging um, an architect. That's why the question around that, as opposed to architectural technician, which is the legal term. Um, and you obviously have both and you have urban planning specialists and so on on your team, but um, I would just note that my life experience has shown and, and, and also with working with, um, with clients of mine like you that um, one, uh, people don't understand what you do, the full range of what you do, and secondly, they don't understand actually how it's bloody good value for money. Mm. Just to exactly. like, have those comments if you didn't mind. Yeah, and and... We, I came to that realization about a year into my business um, that people, that's why we got that investigate, assist and design um, because people just think about that design aspect and that you do that and you produce some drawings. And so articulating those other, for us, those other two things, investigate and assist, um, we do, um, essentially that assisting is like project design management for us um, in a way. Um, and and we can have those conversations, and that's been a real that's been a um, a real significant change. But by just articulating that, <laughs> oh, awesome! Um, well, definitely, if you if you have more questions for, for Matt, do uh, do get in touch. Um, thanks thanks again, Matt. It was um, really informative and. Uh,
definitely no uh, good thank you uh, what we'll do is that we'll quickly do a uh, wrap around the room uh, we don't have long so you've got about 30 to 45 seconds to just introduce yourself um, and uh, talk what you do and then we'll move on uh, so what i'll do is i'll start with uh, top left uh Rowenia. let's start with you and just remember to unmute yourself as well clear good morning everyone kia ora Rowania from Arista Real Estate. So I um, work central Auckland and Matt and I are old buddies. Thank you. Awesome, thanks for winning. Uh, Gemma. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, my name's Gemma. I am a content writer um, and I specialize in creating all of the regular ongoing content that helps keep you visible on the digital stage, uh, mainly focusing on blog articles and newsletter content, um, but also creating um, content for your social media channels and all those wonderful written words um, that we say we don't have the time to create, but we probably just don't have the motivation to write them either. Sure, thanks, Gemma. Uh, Theo. Yeah, Theo from you Protect and Z Insurance Services, personal business insurance specialist. Um, we just, uh, we don't sell insurance. We provide quality advice um, and guidance to our clients. And uh, we do that through the power of active listening. We listen to what our clients want and we provide them the best possible solutions at a cost that is manageable and sustainable. Simple as that. Uh, you protect and insurance services providing security and peace of mind for your family and your business. Thanks, Theo. Malcolm. Hey, good morning, all. Uh, thanks, Matthew, again. Um, I am a business coach. Uh, it's probably the best way to describe what I do. I work with a national company called BSP, Business Success Advisory, um, and we work with clients, uh, any client, to help them to understand why they're in business, what value the business provides, and then help them to get on track with the plan um, and then to various degrees kick their backsides all down the road as they implement the plan and take their business to a different space. Um, my name is Malcolm. I'm with the SP Advisory Business Coach. Thanks, Malcolm. Oh. Good morning, I'm Phil. Um, we deliver online solutions, uh, everything from small you know, websites through to really complex custom software, whether that's on mobile or um, or uh, you know desktop oh, applications. Oh. Um, and we also manage yeah. newsletters for people, so we do content management in terms of the content strategies and, and delivering oh. newsletters for small businesses. Yeah. That's me. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Melanie. Hi everybody, I'm Melanie from the networking group and it's an absolute delight to see you all here today. I, um, I can see Gemma and Phil could work together, there's probably good synergy there. Uh, Gemma, I just wanted to say to you that probably most people don't, it's not about not having the motivation to write their content, it's that they don't have the language skills. So people do need you to help them write their blogs and their, their content. So welcome to the online group, it's a real pleasure to have you here today. Um, I also wanted to just applaud Matthew for um, informing people. I just think making it human and bringing it back to terms that people understand is absolutely fantastic. And I certainly know from experience that those hidden costs you talked about can be absolutely massive. So thanks very much for sharing today. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Melanie. Uh, I guess there's me, I'm Dan, so I run Ingot, which is a digital design studio. So we work with brands and then we work in the uh, online space. So obviously websites um, and uh, that area, uh, but we're a creative design studio um, first. So we're a bunch of creators that love to get a bit geeky. Um, and sometimes it gives me a bunch of gray hairs. Uh, but that's all right, I'm aging gracefully, I, I hope. Uh, yeah, so um, again, a uh, similar uh, area to fill uh, with uh, websites, but we love the, the custom, custom stuff as well. So uh, definitely um, enjoying being part of the group and the uh, education that we're getting. So once again, thank you. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, definitely good to up, um, upsell our knowledge in another area. So um, next fortnight is a long weekend, so there won't be a meeting on the Friday, but there will be one uh, following week. 
as far as I understand. Uh, if I got my dates right, <laughs> I, I see nodding and shaking, and I'm like, oh, I think I think I'm, <laughs> you guys get the drift anyway. Uh, but thank you um, once again. The sessions are recorded on uh, on YouTube, so definitely um, grab uh, that. We can um, uh, send you the link if you want. Just email uh, Melanie and get that sorted for you. Uh, but otherwise, thank you. Hopefully, uh, you can go ahead into a drier weekend. But otherwise, thanks everyone for joining in. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, thanks Dan. Mate. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure to see you all today. Bye for now.